اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان العین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین بار الخلائق اجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین شفیع المذنبین حبیب اللہ العالمین بالقاسم المصطفی محمد اللہم صلی علی علی محمد وعلى آل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین ولعنت اللہ على عدائهم اجمعین من یوم عداوتهم الى یوم الدین اما بعد فقد قال اللہ عز و جل فی کتابه الحکیم وہو اصدق القائلین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لقد خلقنا الانسان فی کبد آمنا باللہ صدق اللہ العلی العظیم محمد و آل محمد السلام علیکم جمعا و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. I pray all of you are well, inshallah, and healthy. We are in the midst of a full-blown wedding season right now. Yeah? Um, and I felt that, inshallah, because of this opportunity for the next two weeks, this Thursday and next Thursday, we're going to be looking at just the Islamic principles of a happy family life. Uh, what it takes for a household to have the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala present within it um, so that it can blossom, right? so that it can grow and it can become better. We're, the, the advice is not limited to a particular area, though it is for married couples and all of you, mashallah, who are seasoned veterans who just need some reminders sometimes, right? You don't need guidance, but just a few reminders. But it also extends to uh, sibling relationships. It relates to father, son, daughter, mother relationships. It relates to in-laws. It, it, it goes in, in all breaths, where if you just look at the core principles that Islam teaches us, whatever relationship that we want to be successful, if these principles can be applied within those relationships for it to blossom. <laughs> But of course, I think a caveat to all of this is something that we will repeat quite frequently and quite often. And that is that for a family unit in whichever relationship we take, for it to be successful, every single person within that unit has to pull their weight. Yeah? That means that every person has to follow and abide by these principles. The moment one person decides to be selfish, and that's what generally takes place. It's not that we choose to be bad. But sometimes my needs and my desires supersede the needs and desires of others and so I will carry out what I want to carry out. But if every single person pulls their weight then that family structure can be very successful. The moment they don't then other people have to start pulling in more weight and that creates imbalance within the family structure and it's these imbalances that oftentimes produce friction within the family and so this is things that we have to be very cautious about and as I said this is a point that is going to be repeated throughout. The responsibility and the onus for a happy family life falls on each individual within that family. Now if we understand that, I think we also have to be cognizant of the fact that family life is not easy. Yeah? We can take as many courses as we want, we can take, read as many books as we want, we know the prophetic traditions, we know the, the principles that we'll talk about today, they're not rocket science, they're not things that we haven't heard of before, but the moment we start living it, that's where the difficulty lies, right? Because we're all individuals. As individuals, we all have our ups and downs, we all have our moments, we all have our own personalities, and so we can understand the base foundation with which we want to work with, but the moment you add individuality in there, um, that's where the challenge comes in, isn't it, right? Um, and that's the fact of life, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the surah, in the verse that I read from Surah Al-Balad, verse number four, very simply puts one of the sunnatul ilahiyya, which is, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ 
fi kabad that we have created mankind in a state of kabad you know what kabad is kabad is distress right um, and what that means that every single human being um, has their own baggage every single human being has their own personality every single human being has their own emotions and sometimes my emotions i just woke up on the wrong side of the bed right i'm just grumpy today for example i'm just not in the mood to talk today now individually that makes sense yeah because you are an individual but now you as a collective you have entirely shifted the dynamics of that family relationship because you yourself were in that state of kabad right now what's really good or was kind of kind of beautiful is that we're all in kabad now you take a married couple and you have now what double kabad right and if you increase that family structure with children you have triple kabad yeah quadruple kabad now imagine the amount of kabad and distress can be in one household this is a fact right but this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very interestingly right we talked about this before that when you take a person a man and you take a woman and you have this double kabad allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in turn says what i give you mawadda and rahma i give you two gifts to combat your double kabad right so that we can have a successful family life and so when we want these gifts of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it requires a lot of effort from our parts another important point to keep in mind as we get started is that one of the most important principles that we have to keep in mind is that no one is perfect right um especially ourselves i think sometimes we are very quick to overcome or overlook our own deficiencies and blame others but no one is perfect and if we can accept that no one is perfect then it becomes a lot easier to deal with stress in a family relationship right we kind of expect this level of perfection from other people but we're not willing to see or analyze our own lives to see if we're putting in that level of perfection and so if we can accept that no one is perfect that people will make mistakes and as long as the person who is making these mistakes be it myself or others is not doing it maliciously like i don't have a malicious intent to harm this relationship i'm just i make mistakes right i say the wrong thing at the wrong time quite often right um well then the other sides have to accept that and say you know what it's a work in progress we're going to we're going to work through this right rather than just saying this person's never going to change accept that this is imperfections do exist but at the same time the person who has these imperfections has to pull their weight to try not to repeat these mistakes it's it's interesting right like cuz one person can't do it all everyone has to pull their weight for there to be success in a family relationship and so these points i think are very important for us to keep in mind the la- the acceptance of imperfection within our family structures and within ourselves um and at the same time that we all have to do a lot of work for there to be success in a family um environment sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad when you look at any family relationship it the primary relationship is the relationship of marriage right um every relationship stems from there the first institution in islam the first um relationships in islam were not the relationships of a father and a son or a brother and a sister but it was the relationship of a husband and a wife and that's how everything else started from and so a lot of the focus that we have pre-marriage is to ensure that we are selective of the type of spouses we pick but we don't want to go into all of those details but we have to understand the importance of the institution of marriage and how every effort needs to be put in to ensure that that marriage is going to be successful and again this plays a part with everyone right not only the husband and the wife um but the in-laws right the in-laws on both sides need to realize that man let them live their life and next week we're going to talk about in-law relationships because quite frankly majority of the marriage problems that i see today are because of the in-laws yeah if the in-laws just learned to take a step back right and not want to interfere so much the relationship would be much healthier but again this is something that everybody has to play a part in right and 
the emphasis should be on trying to create a happy marital life. You know, when you look at the importance of marriage, um, a hadith that I quote in every wedding that I speak in is from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, where he's reported to have said, Ma buniya fil Islam bina'un ahabu ilallahi wa a'az min at tazweej. He says, There is not an institution in Islam that is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the institution of marriage. Marriage accomplishes so much, marriage does so much, right? And, and some of the philosophies associated with marriage are that it, it brings love and companionship. This is something we desperately need in our lives and marriage provides that. We need the ability to fulfill our desires in a halal manner and the marriage allows that. There is spiritual benefit. When you have a partner in your journey towards God, it helps tremendously. And so marriage accomplishes that. And of course, there's a maturing of personality that is associated with marriage that can't be found in any other relationship except through the institution of marriage. But these are the benefits, right? To attain these benefits, um, each and every individual has to strive to show God that they deserve these benefits. I think this is one of the most important points that we have to keep in mind. That the gifts of God, no matter what the gifts of God are, if they are from the perspective of a family life or they're from the perspectives of, of humanity as a whole, God's khazana, God's treasure chest has no limits, right? It has no limits and God is not stingy with what He provides. He provides knowledge, He provides ability, He provides love, He provides forgiveness, He provides everything. But there has to be capacity to receive what God is giving, right? Uh, if you have a lid and that lid is closed, then whatever rain that falls will spill out, right? But if we actually open that lid and allow the rain to fall, that's how we begin to enjoy the grace and the rahmah and the mercy and the barakah and the mawadda and all of these beautiful gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises. And so the striving is so important. Right? Where I say that I want to be successful in this relationship. Where I say I want to make sure that this family has a family where the light and the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shines. At the end of the day, we don't get, we are not going to be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by what we accomplished. Right? We're going to be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the amount of effort we put in to try to accomplish something. Right? You're understanding me or no? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, right? وَأَنْ لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى right? وَأَنْ نَسَعْيَهُ سَوْفَ يُرَى He says that mankind will not, receive the ex will not receive anything except for what they strive for. Right? Like in life, like let's say I want to accomplish being patient, I want to accomplish these different things, but then life throws so many challenges my way, right? So many obstacles my way. I'm not in control of the challenges and the obstacles that come my way, um, but I'm trying. And so God looks at the trying. The trying is so important, right? And so when we come to our family life, it's the trying which is so important. Right? There are like certain base principles that I always advise young couples to, to, to create in their lifestyle when they start off as a family. You know, one of these is that the idea or the concept of divorce needs to be thrown out the window. Yeah? Obviously, we're talking about in situations where there is no abuse and these type of things, right? But in most situations, we have to eliminate the possibility of divorce. If talaq is thrown out the window, then no matter what challenges we go through, we work at it. Yeah, we try really hard at it. But today, like talaq has become a default. Yeah, things didn't work out. Or maybe it's not meant to be. No, it's not, it's not so easy. It shouldn't be so easy, right? To just say that we're going to end it. But these are conversations that we have to have. These are delineations and markings that we need to establish for ourselves within a family. And so we strive, 
right? The whole game is striving, you know, like, um, I remember, you know, Alhamdulillah, we, we got married, we were blessed with the child, and then Allah blessed us with the second child. And someone told me, you know, like, you know, this is the first time you'll notice in your life one plus one doesn't equal two, yeah? Because it's just double the chaos in the house. It's just double the work. It's just double the um, whatever beauty and stress that takes place within the household. But how do parents become successful? They become successful by striving, isn't it? You strive, you try, and you fail a hundred times. But it's not about how many times you fail. It's about whether or not you get up the hundred and first time and try again. right? And life is exactly like that. You fall, you get up. You fall, you get up. You'll have an argument with your wife. Guaranteed within a week, you'll have another argument with your wife. Yeah? Because that's the way life is. You have two individuals who are not going to see eye to eye, but you learn to argue beautifully. Yeah? You learn to communicate correctly. And that's a learning process. right? And inshallah, next week we'll talk about how to argue correctly, how to resolve conflict within a household. But this striving is something that I think we're, we become lazy at. Right? Because we live in an instant gratification world. If I don't see results immediately, I'm not willing to put in that effort. No, the effort is forever. It never stops. Right? And so we have to have that mindset. And again, the reward that is associated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the individual is based on the striving, how much striving we put in. So if we want to maximize the benefits within a marital life, within a family life, there are a couple of points that I think are essential for us to understand. And today we're just going to be looking at two points that create the foundation of everything else that comes on top of it. The first is there has to be a boundary or an understanding of God consciousness and piety within all parties involved, right? Um, it starts with God consciousness. It absolutely does. It starts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is individually and collectively. I am surprised when people get married, they don't have this conversation that what are the boundaries we're going to draw for ourselves within our household, right? Because if my boundaries are what we like to do, then tomorrow what we like to do will change. Now the boundaries have shifted and now there's chaos. Right? But there's one boundary that never shifts, and that's the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Within the household, there has to be a, a conversation that within this household, the laws of God will be observed. And that's the foundation we start with. Right? And so when a married couple starts off with that foundation, then when they do have children, the children will be raised in a God-centric house. We can't just put a band-aid of God-centricity in our lives. No, it has to be living that life, right? I remember I, I had this case at one time where a couple got married because they had the similar interests. They met at a party, right? And you know what happens at a party. But our community, they got married. Our community meaning Shia, Ithna, Ashari. But they got married for all the wrong reasons because they like to party together, right? Um, but then through the years of marriage, one of them grew up, matured, and said, you know what, this is not my interest. But then they had serious conflict because the second one had that interest still. And now they find themselves to be in absolutely different places in life. And that's because the boundaries that they selected were not God-centric, right? And so within a household, there has to be clear conversations. And number one, we don't allow haram things in this house, right? We don't watch or stream haram things. It's always mind-boggling to me when you have a couple who share in haram together like that, yeah? Where they watch a movie where they know this is inappropriate, but they watch it together, yeah? Oftentimes you'll have one person hide and at night watch something. But to have both parties watch something haram together, mind-boggling. That means there's no lines of God anywhere that have been set in that house, right? But we make that decision. We, don't ob we observe the time of prayers. That means when it's time of salah, both stand up and go pray. It's not that one continues to watch the game and one continues to do something. No, it's a time of salah. This is the observation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
we are generous and open-handed together, we keep our promises. All of these things are based on the perspective that we are going to be following the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. God-centricity. This is the number one key. Yeah, I kid you not, if you want. Now, does that mean it's going to be perfect? Absolutely not. We've established it's not perfect. Yeah, It is chaos. It is two individuals. But at least our boundaries are set. Yeah, At least we're not shifting boundaries. We don't know what's happening. No, okay, we know what our limits are. Now, like I said, it's not going to be perfect. What if... The question comes that what if one side or one spouse doesn't hold up their end of the bargain, right? So it will happen or it may happen that one person in their journey towards God is accelerated, right? And the other is not. It's not that the other person is, is bad, right? That's, that's, not the, that's not the translation. We, we're all wired differently, right? And, but... The, the boundaries is what's important. But if you find, for example, that one person is not willing to live by these standards or they're now going away from these standards, I think it's important that there are a couple of things that we must do. Number one, we need to check to in, ensure that the expectations that we have set um, are within limits. You know, sometimes like our expectations are very high, right? Like. I want to pray Salat al-Layl every night, you have to wake up. No, I don't have to wake my wife up to pray. She doesn't have to wake me up to pray Salat al-Layl. As long as we pray the wajib namazes together, I don't have to force my spouse to do all the mustahabbat. God doesn't force us. Who are we to force, right? Um, and so we need to ensure that our understandings of the boundaries that are set are, are manageable. Our expect, uh, the expectations are normal. Like if you have... Um, like one spouse like who works and they come back home and they're tired and they, they have all of these things and they, you have a, a, a housewife who will work all day. You know, I think one of the, one of the lessons that I learned and I, when I speak to a lot of guys, we all learned very clearly when we had to work from home is that it's not easy working at home. Yeah? Uh, I think we appreciated our wives a heck of a lot more to say that, oh my God, they do so much. Right in the course of the day, um, but I can't have these expectations. Like I'm fasting Monday, Thursday. You have to fast Monday, Thursday. No, we don't. We can't. We need to ensure that our expectations are normal. And so, as long as the expectations are within the wajib and the haram, right? I think that's normal. We can expect there to be no music in our house. We can expect there to not have haram things in our house. That's, that's not an unordinary expectation to have within a household. Um, number one, so if you find that your spouse is not holding up their end of the bargain, that's the first thing we need to check. We need to check whether or not the expectations are normal or have our expectations changed over a period of time. If you find that it's the boundaries that we've set with God that are in question, um, that's where we have to now engage in some conversations with our spouse, right? Um, we need to, number one, or number two now, ensure that, that what we would like to happen, we ourselves are doing it. You understand? So it can't just be lip service that I'm giving. Like if I don't want my spouse to do X, Y, and Z, then I can't be doing A, B, and C, which is also problematic. There has to be a level of consistency, right? Um, so like if I want my spouse like, not to or to do something um, that is, for example, like not listen to music on her headphones when she's cooking or he's cooking or he's doing something, right? Or he's mowing the lawn, not just the girls, right? Um, then I can't, for example, use profanity when someone cuts me off while driving. You understand? There has to be consistency in akhlaq. There has to be consistency in the observation of the limits that are set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I need to make sure and analyze my own life that there is that level of consistency that exists, but I show it through action. Um, Number three, I try to reason with them. So I think an important point that we'll talk about next week is, is conflict, right? Like how to address conflict and communicate without it leading 
like you know like by definition conflict is whenever we don't agree with each other there's a conflict but the conflict can be managed nicely it can be done well rather than it leading to a shouting match with each other right um, and that's an art that's not something that just comes like naturally we're we're programmed to try to get our point across and so we just raise our voices and raise our voices and that's all that takes place but there's a way to do it and so if i find that the behavior of one spouse is detrimental to the relationship of our family um, then we need to have reasonable conversations with them to try to show like how our behavior is affecting not only myself but let's say the rest of our family right like if you have a spouse and you have children in the house and one spouse keeps watching TV even though it's time of salah we can in a short span of time see how the behavior of the children have changed and comes to observation of the time of salah and so these are practical things that we can demonstrate and show number 4 we have to pray to Allah yeah i mean this is not easy situations that we're talking about these are sadly real life situations um and they're traumatic like when you have a non happy life at home it ruins your whole life everywhere else and again this is not just spouse like like a child can do this ruin the structure of a family a parent can do this and this is why like i said everybody's got to pull their weight yeah it's so important that everyone pulls their weight right and the moment one doesn't you'll see like like cracks in this structure the last thing is that if you find that it's still not working and it's still chaotic and now we've done all of these things this is when we have to go for mutual like a counseling to a person that we both agree to go to right um nowhere in this conversation is divorce even talk about right um but it's it's going towards somewhere where we both have to agree to a person who can mediate this for us and if we find a person that we both agree can mediate this for us then we have to have the humility to accept the mediation that comes from that right and we can't just then say no he didn't side with me she didn't side with me and it's done i don't agree right um so these are number 1 about god consciousness and again this is the conversation that you can still have today even though you may have been married for 25 or 30 years the second is um love and affection yeah love and affection you know there's a hadith from amir al mu'minin ali ibn abi talib alayhi salam ma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad wa kullu qarabatin he says yahtaj ila muwadda he says every relationship requires love and affection every relationship we human beings um, need it yeah we need to be loved we need to be appreciated we need um that level of affection is something that's very powerful right um i think an important point here that is sometimes a cause of a lot of conflict within a household is that each individual has a different language of affection yeah has a different way of demonstrating that love and so what happens is that you may have a husband whose demonstration or he thinks his demonstration of showing love is by paying the mortgage for example and he says look at all the work that i'm doing right and how can you say i don't love you i go out in the morning he may never say i love you right but he will say look at all these things that i do and you may have a spouse who just needs to be appreciated thank you for cooking the meal today yeah you look nice today yeah thank you for packing my lunch today that thank you can make that spouse feel loved the problem is we both speak our own languages right and there's this whole science behind the language of love you can read up on it right um we have to learn each other's language of love right and not only then do we have to learn each other's language of love i need to try to adopt or adopt the language that my spouse has and she needs to adopt the language that he has so that whenever one person resorts back to their own language of love 
there is no animosity that is taking place because we have understood each other's language of love. You all get that? Yeah, if you learn that, you will have mastered a trick very beautiful. Yeah, not a trick, a beautiful reality of understanding how that works. And so this affection is necessary, right? And part of that affection, just a couple of things that I think are important. Number one, how do I demonstrate affection? Be pleasant in character. Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that we, we don't smile enough with our families. Right? Like we're like extremely grumpy when we come home. And so like my stress, you know, like Musa Nukar, Isa Uparai, we say, right? Like my anger of everyone else has come home to my wife now. And my wife feels the brunt of my moodiness. Well, that's not really fair, is it? Right? That's not fair at all. And so I need to just smile more. Right? Just be more pleasant. Have conversation. And I think that sometimes we, we have too many like modu charawilu moments, you know, where we just don't want to talk and we're just mouth closed and ha, ha. Like one word answers, you're like, bro, relax, right? She's not your enemy. He's not your enemy, right? Like learn to be more pleasant in character. So that's number one. Um, be more pleasant in character. Um, we have a hadith from our first Imam who says, Sababul Mahabba al Bishr. He says the the cause of love is cheerfulness. Simply just being cheerful, being a good person to be around, a person who can make you laugh, a person who smiles together, enjoys life together. That's number one. Number two, pay attention to your spouse. Right? This goes both ways. Today with our phones. I can much more easier say I love you to my wife on a text than I can in person. Okay? It feels odd to say I love you, so I'll say I love you. Uh, long, long beautiful messages on text, but wording wise, like I can't do it. Right? Well, learn it. Yeah, I learn it. Like it's really important that we're able to, to give that love and affection through attention uh, to our spouses. So we need to learn to respect their feelings. We don't have to agree with their feelings, but we need to learn to respect their feelings. You know, sometimes a child may feel a certain way and will dismiss it to say, no, you're wrong. No, they're not wrong. That's their feeling. Yeah, that's their feeling. But you can describe to them your feeling and try to see how you can come to a middle pass to make sure that the feelings are all appreciated. They're all accepted, right? Um, listening, helping around the house, sharing interest, these are all part of paying attention. Number three, overlook the mistakes of, the part of each other. Right? Um, like we said, no one's perfect. But the problem is that we don't want to overlook mistakes. And, 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 and we're vengeful. Yeah? We'll bring it up like five years later. Right? Like, remember? And you're like, no, I don't remember. <laughs> like, I remember. Yeah? And we don't forget. Right? And so this is a problem. Like, Im I often think that all of our problems will get solved if we learn to have the akhlaq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Allah is forgiving. Right? So like when we are forgiven, Allah is not going to come back five years later. But Yadjah, you remember you did that? No, it's forgiven. Right? And His forgiveness or His ability to not hold me accountable for a mistake and still reward me and give me grace yeah it's um it's the most amazing thing that that i think that can't be put into context can't be put into words right like how many times have we missed salatul fajr and then something good still happened that day and you're like man i didn't deserve that i didn't deserve that like but if somebody had done that to us I right? made a mistake and we wouldn't give anything nice to them, right? Um, and the last one, and this is important. Protect the faults and the shortcomings of your spouses. Yeah? Protect it. Um, from your friends, I think we mentioned it last, last week. Wife jokes are not okay. Yeah? Absolutely not okay. The wife can never be like the end of a joke. Yeah? They, you know, like... My wife won't let me go. Visa name mila. Yeah, we have all of these things that we throw out when we talk to our friends. No, that's not funny. Yeah? Don't use your wife as that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hunna libasun lakum. Wa antum libasun lahunna. You are clothing for each other, right? And this is even more true when it comes to the in laws. Yeah? That sometimes in laws want to be 
with good intentions, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. With good intentions, they want to be nosy. Yeah? They want to find out, what did she say? What is, you have to protect your spouse. Yeah? And it's a balancing act that you do. If you can do these two things, if we can do these two things, then inshallah we will find that we will have a successful family life with drama, yeah, but we will be able to overcome that drama and receive the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We end with a few words of Masaib. And today I want to remember the man who brought hope to everyone in Karbala. And that is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. You know, Abbas had that personality. Abbas was loyal. Abbas had faith. But the one quality that Abbas very beautifully possessed is that he brought hope into everyone who was there. And this is why till the last moments when Abbas would say, Mawla, let me go. Allow me to go. What did Imam al Hussein say? Abbas, you are the standard bearer of my army. How can I let you? But Mawla would say, Mawla, there is no army besides you and I. But that was who Abbas was. That's when Zainab alayhi salam was coming to bid, what came Abbas to bid farewell to Zainab. We are told, what did Zainab say? That Zainab said, Abbas, since the time that I was a child, I've been hearing that my hijab will be removed. But then Abbas, you came into my life. And I thought to myself that how is it possible for one to have a brother like Abbas for this time? But now that you go, Abbas, I know this will be a reality. <laughs> and this is that hope of Sakina. <laughs> I want you to picture yourself as this young child. That when Abbas comes and says, I am now going to get water. <laughs> how Sakina must have had this hope fill her entire heart. And then when she saw that Alam come back. But, <laughs> but it wasn't Abbas. That moment, Sakina never asked for water. فَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا وَيَّمُنْ قَلَبِي يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْآقِبَةٌ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the return of our Imam, to forgive the sins of our parents and loved ones, that for those who are going through difficulty, that he end their difficulty. For those that have asked us to pray for them, Ya Allah, accept their hajat. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sameeul alim. Wa tub alayna inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Rahimallahu man kara surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha. Masbuqatan bis salati ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad.